On this Tuesday night, a deeply divided America votes. How people are feeling about the fierce fight for control of Congress. Both sides are so polarizing. The battle over mail-in ballots and the power of attack ads. Should politicians find a new way to try to persuade voters? Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. Firing back, Beijing's response to allegations it interfered in a Canadian election. Plus, their bravery and selflessness were often overlooked. I didn't tell anybody I was Indigenous. What these veterans were denied. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight from Washington. Today we face an inflection point. One of those moments that comes around every three or four generations. We know in our bones that our democracy is at risk, and we know that this is your moment to defend it. Well, I think if they win, I should get all the credit, and if they lose, I should not be blamed at all, okay? That's former President Donald Trump speaking in an interview with News Nation tonight. He and the current president making final pitches to American voters. Neither man is actually on the ballot in today's midterm election. Donald Trump isn't even running for office, at least not yet, but he is still a dominating influence over the Republican Party as Americans go to the polls. Republicans are hoping they can win enough seats to take control of Congress from their political opponents. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We are here for midterm elections. They're called midterms because they happen in the middle of the four-year presidential term. And right now, President Biden's party, the Democrats, control Congress, but by just a razor-thin margin. Jackson Prosco, our Washington bureau chief, is with me. Jackson, the polls are now closed in a number of states, too early to give any conclusive results. Any reports of problems at the poll stations? I think the big picture takeaway is that things went smoothly. Obviously, there's a ton of interest in these midterms. 45 million people voted in advance. We saw lots of lineups today, but only a few problems. But the point is, those problems are already being seized upon by Republicans who are looking to build a narrative about election fraud and an untrustworthy election, specifically Maricopa County in Arizona. That's the most populous county there. And there was trouble today with some of the voting machines not reading ballots properly. Now, they fixed the issue, but that didn't stop Republicans from going to court to seek an emergency injunction to extend voting hours. And of course, they tried to blame Democrats for the fiasco, even though the county is run by Republicans and Republicans run the elections there as well. Just a sense, though, of how this is playing out. Mm -hmm. And you were at a polling station today. What did people tell you about what's motivated them to vote? We were out in a part of Virginia that's reliably purple, could go either way. And voters really seem concerned with the overall fate of the country and, of course, those kitchen table issues like inflation, like the economy, and, of course, women's access to health care. Take a listen. The direction of the country politically with the division is probably the biggest underlying issue. I have a daughter, so uh, it, uh, for me it has been the pro-choice. The kind of restrictions that are being put up is a big deal. Worried about the future of the country. Um, I'm not, I, I just don't want Trump coming back. Let me just put it that way. Inflation is actually is a top issue. It's, uh, everybody's just worried about what's going on trying to keep prices down a little bit, make it easy for everyone. It's uh, where we're headed, you know, because there's so many issues that are at stake that, you know, um, that we have to think about everything. This isn't going to be over tonight. There are millions of mail-in ballots that won't be counted for some time. Jackson, that is not fraudulent. It's just the way things work, but it could pose a problem. Yeah, it really could. Already tonight, we're seeing former President Donald Trump seize upon those problems in Arizona. We are expecting it could take up to two weeks to get a final count there. Pennsylvania is very similar. It could take a week or more for final results there. And Donna, you know that in this lull, while we're waiting for the final results, they're going to be claiming there are problems that make the final result untrustworthy worthy, yet we could not know the balance of power. It may not be decided until December, uh, depending on how things go in, in that tight race in Georgia. All right, Jackson, thank you. Well, in the coming days, we could be looking at a different political picture here in the U.S., Canada's neighbor, ally, and biggest trading partner. The Democrats are fighting to hold on to control of Congress, and if history is any guide, the odds are against them. Eric Sorensen is looking at the potential outcomes and what's at stake. Donna, it comes down to arithmetic. 
For the House of Representatives, all 435 seats are up for election. It takes 218 to win control of the House. The party of the sitting president usually loses seats. Since the Second World War, that party has lost, on average, 26 seats. And from the results in 2020, the Republicans only need to flip five Democratic seats. The Senate is even tighter, effectively at 50-50, with Vice President Kamala Harris casting the tie-breaking vote for Democrats. 35 Senate seats are being contested, with razor-thin margins expected in several of the states. Democrats could actually gain in Pennsylvania, but they could lose seats that they hold in Georgia, Nevada, Arizona. Historically, Republican turnout has outperformed pollsters' expectations, but Democrats hope with so much at stake that they will defy the polling this time. It's a choice. It's a choice between two very different visions of America. Voters may cast out Democrats largely because of inflation. The economy is number one. But so much more will change. Policies from climate change to abortion rights, even support for Ukraine could end. The congressional investigation of Donald Trump would stop, and Republicans with control of the House will turn on Biden. There will be uh, investigations probably immediately into Joe Biden, members of his, his administration, into his son. And it runs deeper than just the House and the Senate. Republican state and local officials could win control over how elections work, with one goal in mind, says David Frum. To elect pro-Trump weirdos to these jobs. They will elect many, many of these people to run elections in a way that is uh, without, that is aggressively unfair and that will set aside the will of the voters. And if they refuse to accept the results from some states, then you have a disruption in democracy and you can have just, just pure chaos. Which is why Democratic voters fear that democracy itself is at stake. Truth no longer matters. Truth has been lost with these folks. Last night on CNN, Speaker Nancy Pelosi talked about the kind of politics that led to the hammer attack on her husband. It's really sad because it is um, a, a flame that was fueled by misinformation. Nancy Pelosi said, please don't call. Donald Trump, meantime, talked about Pelosi, called her an animal. Of course, I think she's an animal, too. You want to know that? And they cheered. After tonight, Nancy Pelosi could lose her speakership. And Donald Trump's star could rise again. That's what's at stake. Eric Sorensen, Global News. Now, in other news, as we reported yesterday, sources have told Global News investigative reporter Sam Cooper the Chinese government was behind an aggressive influence campaign during the 2019 Canadian federal election, which included funding a network of at least 11 candidates. Sources tell Global News it's a threat Canada's intelligence services felt was so serious the Prime Minister and select members of Cabinet were briefed. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson is with me. Mercedes, how has the Chinese government reacted to this story? That's right, Donna. It seems that both the story and the Prime Minister's response to it have registered with Beijing, hitting a nerve. On Monday, we asked the Prime Minister about Sam's story. Mr. Trudeau didn't mince his words, accusing China of playing aggressive games with Canadian democracy and of targeting Canadian institutions. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson hit back today during his daily press conference, claiming China isn't interested in Canada's internal affairs. And warning that Canada should, quote, stop making remarks that are detrimental to China-Canada relations. A long editorial also appeared in a Chinese state-controlled media outlet condemning the Canadian Prime Minister for accusing China of interference and warning that there could be consequences if Canada continues to back what it labeled as U.S.-controlled foreign policy. And what's been the reaction from politicians in Canada? Well, Conservative foreign affairs critic Michael Chong released a statement today accusing Beijing of interfering in Canadian democracy and calling on the Liberal government to move faster. In a statement, Mr. Chong said, the biggest victim of these PRC intimidation and interference operations is the Chinese community themselves, calling on the Trudeau government to, quote, do more to protect the Chinese community from the PRC's threats and to protect Canadian democracy. Now, allied countries like Australia have have chosen to bring in updated laws that address concerns about Chinese state interference, including modern counter-espionage legislation and a foreign agent's registry. And while the Prime Minister has promised to do more, he has not given us any specifics on what that could look like or a timeline of when it might happen. Donna? 
All right. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. This is National Indigenous Veterans Day in Canada. Coming up, the discrimination these soldiers faced and why this day means so much to them. Voting is underway in the U.S. midterm elections. It could change the balance of power in the capital. We're back from Washington in a moment. This ceremony is one of several that took place today in honor of National Indigenous Veterans Day. The event was founded in Winnipeg in 1994 and has since spread across the country. For decades, an estimated 12,000 Indigenous veterans who served in the three major wars were not formally acknowledged on November 11th. Nitho Garcha spoke with several Indigenous service members in BC to hear what this day means to them. He was 16 years old, playing senior hockey. Richard Vidan's father, Hector, was just a teenager when he traded in his hockey jersey for a military uniform. He was quite the hockey player. A young man from the residential school system suddenly on a path overseas. He turned 17 in May of that 1940 and then enlisted in the Rocky Mountain Rangers. Hector's service in the Second World War came after his boss fired him from his job in construction. He said, there are people saying, why isn't an Indian working? when there's white men that need a job. Vidan says his father married a British war bride and decided the best way to protect their children was to hide their heritage, never telling them their First Nations. From residential school experience where he had contracted rheumatic fever and been bedridden, he learned that no matter how hard you work, um, what you do, you can't change the basic element skin color features. Vidan says he only confirmed his ancestry as a member of Nisqalnith Band halfway through his 11 years of service. When I was commissioned as an officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force in 68, that was only eight years after uh, my relatives and myself had been given the right to vote. Exempt from conscription, they volunteered to serve while giving up their Indigenous status. Many Indigenous soldiers were denied the same benefits as other returning veterans, while their reserve land was sold away. And it wasn't until 1995 Indigenous vets were allowed to lay wreaths at the National War Memorial on Remembrance Day. First Nations Inuit and Métis are leaving to go into harm's way from a third world country without resources and coming back to the same circumstance. It's not that long ago. Acknowledging that sacrifice and injustice is what November 8th is about. I didn't tell anybody I was Indigenous. Says veteran and trauma counsellor Joy Dockery. No health benefits, no land to call their own. Still racism and discrimination, no houses to live in. So what was the thing that they did? They re-enlisted in the Korean War. Dockery now leads an association for veterans. I found an ad in the newspaper advertising for summer employment for students, so I joined. And this group is part of Vancouver's Remembrance Ceremony. Canada finally recognizes the Indigenous people. We are getting there, but we haven't made it yet. It's a chance to, to recognize and understand all that, that our people gave and we're not recognized for. An opportunity to honor the history and the heritage. More and more veterans finally feel they no longer have to hide. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Tawasan, BC. We will have live coverage of this year's Remembrance Day ceremony in Ottawa at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 7.30 Pacific, right here on Global and on our website, globalnews.ca. Back to school in Ontario, ahead where contract negotiations stand between the province and its education workers. Ontario Premier Doug Ford says his government is back at the bargaining table with what he calls an improved offer for education workers. He didn't give any details, but said the deal offers a higher amount for the 55,000 union members who walked off the job on Friday. You know, it comes down to the art of negotiations on both sides. We have to sit down there, uh, give a little on both sides uh, for the betterment of, of the students, of the parents, and, and the uh, low-income workers. 
Schools reopened this morning after the Ford government promised to rescind a law it passed that imposed a contract on the workers and banned them from striking. QP, the union representing the employees, says it is still in a legal strike position, but will focus now on renewed bargaining efforts. At the inquiry into the use of the Federal Emergencies Act, there was testimony today that Ontario Solicitor General pitched the idea of organizing a meeting with the protesters blockading Windsor's Ambassador Bridge earlier this year. In return, they had to immediately leave. The superintendent of the Ontario Provincial Police testified officers delivered a letter outlining that plan to the protest organizers the night before the bridge was cleared. The party atmosphere had certainly began. Um, and uh, again, it was just very disappointing that um, the letter had little effect. Dana Early testified that after the letter was delivered, the majority of protesters remained on the bridge. Witnesses say there was no single recognized leader of the blockade. The bridge was cleared on February 13th before the Emergencies Act was invoked. And here is one of the most unique voting booths in the world. It doubles as a bunk on the International Space Station. So even from space, American astronaut Josh Quesada cast his ballot. We're back from Washington, D.C. in a moment. We know politics is polarized in America, and now it's made worse by a barrage of political attack ads. John Fetterman has a love affair with criminals. Fetterman's plan keeps the drugs flowing, the killers killing, and the children dying. Herschel Walker, decades of violence against women, guns, razor blades choking, stalking, he can't be our senator. Whose side were you on? The cops who defended our democracy or the criminals who tried to overturn it? Yes, Lee Vega defended these guys. Who are the Democrats bringing into our cities and how many more kids will suffer? Tell Biden and his friends in Washington, stop hurting our children. Turn on your TV here in the U.S., and it has been back-to-back -back political ads that often make misleading claims. They're online, too, now more than ever. A nonpartisan group that tracks political advertising called Ad Impact has calculated that spending on political ads in 2022 in the U.S. is on pace to reach $9.7 billion. It has never been that high not even in the last presidential election. Politics here is a winner-takes-all game. Someone who thinks differently from you is not just wrong, they are the enemy. Earlier today, I spoke with a writer who says that is alien to the heart of democratic theory, that you can change minds, not through fear, but through persuasion. The Persuaders at the front lines of the fight for hearts, minds and democracy is the title of Anand Girdadas's latest book. He is a former foreign correspondent and columnist and he is with me from Brooklyn, New York. Hi there, Anand. You know, persuasion in politics is what campaigning, I think, used to be about, convincing voters that your ideas about social services, taxes, whatever, to make your community better. Uh, but in 2022, I've talked to so many people here who say they don't even talk politics with their family or friends because it inflames such anger. What's your assessment of the state of the United States right now? Well, the, the United States is in a really big uh, pickle because democracy itself is uh, being tested in this country as it has only been in in. in truly intense moments uh, in American history. Right now, one of the two major political parties is essentially running uh, to sabotage the practice of democracy itself, and that's the modern Republican Party that is running on a platform of uh, white racial resentment, male grievance at having to live in an egalitarian world, uh, and trying to, you know, overturn the will of the people in, in many contests across the country uh, and advocate for political violence as a normal way to kind of get the world you want. So in that context, uh, it is as important, if not more important than ever, for those on the pro-freedom, pro-democracy side, the Democratic Party and its allies in the United States, to be able to persuade. And you're right, it has gotten harder. And so what is the playbook, if you can condense it? I mean, you are offering some hope, uh, uh, you know, how to work to bridge divisions, to find common ground. How do you do it? Well, I think the anti-democracy movement, the fascist movement increasingly in the United States, is actually quite good at understanding human beings as we actually are and building a politics 
on top of a realistic sense of how people form their opinions, what their emotional response to the news is, what their fears and anxieties are. And in many ways, what the Persuaders book is arguing for is for pro-freedom, pro-democracy forces in this country to become better at a human-centered politics. I think there's a notion of being willing to pick fights. It's another part of the Persuaders playbook, being willing to pick righteous fights. Uh, with all due respect to Michelle Obama, who some years ago said, when they go low, we go high. Uh, I don't. Go high, I, you know? I think it's also possible to say, you know, when they go low, we hit harder. So let me ask you why you think that has not happened on the Democratic side. The Republicans, as you say, have been good at commanding attention, maybe better at sort of meeting people where they're at. Why have the Democrats up till now dropped the ball on that? I think it's a, it's a very good question. I think it's a high mindedness and I think it comes from a good place at some deep level. I think there's a sense that there's a belief in citizens that is kind of almost like a classical, like ancient Greek idea of citizens. I think Democrats have in the U.S. gotten into a pattern of imagining who they wished voters were and speaking to that high minded person in a kind of policy language, a wonky language, and not really being a guttural party, not, not able to speak to the gut, not able to speak to the ref, reptile brain, and looking down on things like storytelling, you know, looking down on things like message as being unnecessary. Uh, we need a real renaissance on the political left if, if we are going to outcompete fascism and seize the age and deliver people the future of nice things that we deserve. Anand Girdardos, thanks. He did have a lot more to say. You can watch the full interview online on our website, globalnews.ca slash globalnational. That is our newscast for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching. For now, good night from Washington, D.C.